Let's talk about modern deviations in the Krishna conscious movement. How would you analyze them? Right now, there's three deviant groups. And within each group, there's subsets or schisms. Some are very obvious schisms, and some are somewhat covert. The first deviation was the first transformation, which took place in its culmination. It was already it already had momentum while Prabhupada was still present. But its culmination, when this first transformation took place in full, was in the spring of 1978. That's what we call, in the Vaishnava Foundation, we call the first deviation or the first transformation. We call it the fabricated so-called ISKCON, and you, you put quotation marks around the acronym ISKCON. This deviation had many components to it, but the primary component by far was the false allegation that Prabhupada had appointed 11 gurus. He never did appoint 11 gurus at any time. The so-called basis in the beginning until it was exposed was the May 28, 1977 room conversation, a very cryptic conversation in Vrindavan, India, between two leading secretaries, both of whom had the order of sannyas and Prabhupada, in which it was supposedly substantiated that Prabhupada set the foundation or, or the uh, legitimacy, the fact of the so-called appointment, but there's no such thing in that. You know, when you read, it was called the appointment tape in the beginning, and that name is still recognized by some of the older devotees as being the name for that tape, but there's no appointment in it. It's simply talking about general principles of what, what constitutes guru, where Srila Prabhupada says, but by my order, meaning that for anyone to become guru in the Krishna consciousness movement, that person has, has to have received the order from Prabhupada to be guru, but by my order. Now, how, how does one receive that order? Well, while he was here, it could have been done in, in, in two very obvious ways. It could have been done verbally, and, and if it was recorded or if there was enough witnesses present, then the order to be guru would be very obvious. Or it could have been done in a written form in which the Prabhupada signed the letter just like he signed thousands of letters. He could have signed the document stating, I recognize such and such disciple as a spiritual master. Such order was never given in that way while he was physically manifest. Now that he's no longer physically manifest, he, he, the devotee, his devotee can still receive the order, but it has to be received. It can't be concocted. Neither can it be taken as a general thing. For example, Yari Deki Tarakaha Krishna Upadesh in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, where Prabhupada says, Lord Chaitanya orders everyone to be guru. Well, that is not what he's referring to in that appointment tape, quote-unquote appointment tape. That means you become guru by becoming qualified and then receive the order from your spiritual master. In fact, in the folio, Sri the Prabhupada, in a room conversation, was once asked in a somewhat, little bit of a challenging way, but even the question itself had an intrinsic challenge to it, that how did you become guru? And Prabhupada was very abrupt about it, but he did say, he didn't like the question, that was clear when you read the transcript, but he did say that my guru ordered me. So, this is the standard set, and it makes total sense that this is the standard, namely that you cannot become a diksha guru, an initiating spiritual master, until you receive the order of your spiritual master. Now, in Prabhupada no longer being physically manifest, but he's Sampradaya Acharya, completely pure devotee Mahabhagavat, Shaktivesh avatar, while he was with us, to say that you cannot have contact with his divine grace through the Prabhupada after he has departed is complete nonsense. Where's there any belief in spiritual life if you think like that? Of course you can't. Of course you should have such contact 
the more the better. And it's on the basis of when Srila Prabhupada wants to give you that benediction that he was going to contact you. So, the order can be given now to any disciple, and it can also be faked that one has received the order. Or you can delude yourself and say, well, Yaideki Ta Ka Krishna Upadesh, I received the order by this generic order from Lord Chaitanya. No, that's not what is what he was saying. He never gave the order while he was here, and that was in May of 28, the so-called appointment tape. In April of 1977, in Bombay, before he came to Vrindavan, one of his leading secretaries, who happened to be one of the two that was present in Vrindavan on May 28th of 77, he was with him in a, and there was a room conversation. We all have access to this, where that leading secretary said, but for right now we cannot be guru because we are not self-realized. And Prabhupada says, yes. So, from that position, April 1977, where Prabhupada confirms that none of his disciples have reached the stage where they can be guru, when his leading disciple, not leading disciple, his leading secretary at the time, says that, admits, honestly, some fresh wind of a little honesty there, admits that no one was guru because no one is self-realized and Prabhupada confirms it. So from that position, April 1977, and then all of a sudden, in November 1977, you have 11 Mahabhagavats on the highest platform of Tattva Darshana? Nah, this is nonsense. And it has been proven to be nonsense. So the first deviation was this idea that Prabhupada in May of 77 appointed a, a gurus, which he confirmed then by name in the July 9th document, which is simply, anyone who reads the document, in an unbiased way, you can see it is simply an appointment of 11 Ripviks because there had been a long time when there were no uh, no initiations. So the, there was a long waiting list of devotees wanting to be initiated by His Divine Grace, which had been done through the Ritvik process for years, but then it was suspended because Prabhupada was very ill. So then, the July 9th simply says, here are the men to do Ritvik. Ritvik Acharya means on behalf of the actual Acharya, they are Ritviks, they are priests, on behalf of the Acharya to conduct the ceremony. The initiator is His Divine Grace through the Prabhupada. This is actually made clear in the document itself, as if it needed to be, it really didn't need to be. We all knew at that time. We all knew what Ritvik was. It is no big thing. Some sannyasi, or in some cases some temple president or some uh, commissioner, is appointed to be Ritvik, and so he chants the beads on behalf of the spiritual master. It's just a technicality, because the spiritual master has a worldwide international movement. Uh, for him to have to, all right, I have, a, I have a disciple now in New Orleans, I'm here in India, I need to fly all the way to New Orleans to give the initiative. No, you let a Ritvik do it. So the first deviation was this idea that Prabhupada appointed gurus, and then this got embellished in a big way by that they, they had to be Mahabhagavats. Mat guru si jaga guru, we know where that came from. So they had to be now these so-called gurus who were never as such recognized as gurus. Maybe they were recognized as being powerful leading secretaries, sannyasis, things of that, but that's not spiritual master tattva darshanaha. Tadvidhi pranipatena pari prashnena sevaya upadekshyanti te jnanam jnaninas tattva darshana. Tadvidhi, if you want to learn the process, the vidhi, the things to do in order to unfold the bhakti lata bij which you will receive from the guru at the time of initiation, that's a plan. The bij is a plan that needs to be unfolded in a very uh, deliberate, perfect way. Then if you tut vidhi, if you want to know that vidhi, what vidhi's to do in order to make that plan successfully unfold so that your creeper goes back to the spiritual sky. Tut vidhi pranipatena. First of all, be very submissive. Pariprashnena, ask some good spiritual questions. 
Sevaya. Have the Seva attitude. Perform service. When the Guru says, I'd like this to be done, then not only do the service, but try to do it in such a perfect way that he's impressed, not just merely pleased. Tadvidhi pranipatena pari prashnena sevaya upadekshyanti diksha upadekshyanti. They, uh, plural, they will. Upadekshyanti, they will give you diksha. Te, to you, jnanam. They'll give you knowledge. Brahmagyan, Tattvagyan, Upadekshyanti te jnanam, jnanin us, of those who have the jnana. In other words, not uh, A, B, C, D devotees, but devotees who are very absorbed and uh, deep in knowledge. Guru means heavy in knowledge. Gyan in us, those who have that knowledge, tattva darshana, who, who have tattva, seen the truth. Darshana means seeing the truth. Darshana. So, anarta, someone who has anarta would be a tattva darshi? Of course not. Impossible. Completely against the whole teaching. No disciple of Srila Prabhupada received that order while he was physically manifest. That's very clear. It was not given to any individual disciple. Ritvik was given. That's not, that's Ritvik Acharya. That's not Diksha Guru. And then, arbitrarily, come uh, the, the so called appointment tape, May of 77. Then, uh, within March of 78, so less than a year, now all of a sudden, there's 11 gurus. Never is such recognized by the Sampradaya Acharya, his divine grace through the Prophet. What is the basis of their being Guru? Oh, Ritvik Acharya? No, that's not a basis of being Guru. Although that was said by the so called higher authority when the question was asked, what's the basis? Oh, they were Ritviks appointed as Ritvik Acharya. Oh, Ritvik Acharya, then it becomes as good as Acharya. No, it does not. Acharya is a neutral term. It can mean many things. You can be an Acharya in weapons. But that does not make you a guru to be able to give the Diksha, Upadekshyanti Te Gyanam, Gyaninas. You're not a Tattva Darshi at that level. You're just expert at weapons, so you're an Acharya in weapons. Uh, this, this is all rascaldom. It is deviation. You asked the question was, what was the deviations? I'm now delineating the deviations. The first deviation was this first transformation of the status of guru. That in March 78, due to some very bad advice received in Navadweep, the seeds needed the soil. So the soil was there to fertilize their material ambitions. And the poison is personal ambition, and that's what they were loaded with. So... Then 11 gurus with no solid basis, and then all of a sudden all Mahabhagavats, and all of a sudden 11 zones, that the world was divided into 11 zones, that these 11 Mahabhagavats then function in. And if you say, well, everybody agrees now that the zonal acharya was wrong. Everybody agrees, no one disagrees. Fine. That's a deviation. It's a big deviation. It's a colossal institution on anartha. So if everybody agrees, then what you're saying is, if you're honest, which you aren't, but if you're honest, if you say everybody agrees with the 11 zones were all colossal impositions, foisting a colossal hoax, popes of the zone. So then, if you agree that it was a deviation, then you must also agree that there was no gurus. Because Guru cannot indulge in such a colossal anartha, he doesn't indulge in any anartha. As soon as you say that Guru can have anartha, as soon as you say that, then anybody, everybody, every Joe Schmo can be a Guru. Everybody can go into Chaitanya Charitamrita and say, Yaradeke Taika Krishna Upadesh with Bhakta Tam comes into the temple, second day in, he happens to spot that verse. So I'm being ordered by Lord Chaitanya to be Guru. Rascal, dumb. Anybody can see this is not right. 
So the first deviation was the fabricated so-called ISKCON. Now when we say ISKCON, I'm not referring to Srila Prabhupada's pure movement. That's an acronym. We all know what the acronym means. Uh, but I'm putting quotation marks on each side of that acronym. I'm saying it's a different thing. The fabricated so-called quote-unquote ISKCON is not the same as ISKCON. The fabricated so-called ISKCON covers ISKCON. It is a covering potency. Avaranatmaka Shakti. First of all, you're in the spiritual sky. You misuse your free will. Prakshapatmaka Shakti. You get pulled out. Avaranatmaka Shakti. You get covered over. This Avaranatmaka Shakti is everywhere in the material world. It has to be. So the real Iskan got covered over. This was the first deviation with such things like, oh, just put on the uniform and then you will become the soldier. That can work on the relative plane, but that is not the absolute process. The absolute process is diametrically 180 degrees the opposite. The spiritual process is that when you receive the order from your spiritual master to be guru, when you are qualified, that you are free from anartha completely, and you are full of knowledge, jnana vairagya, Saivai Pung Sang Paro Tharmo, Yato Paktir at Hokshaje, Ahaita Kyapratiata, Yayatma Supersiddhati. When that jnana and vairagya is there, because touch Tradatana Munayo, jnana vairagya yuktaya, you're linked with it. Jnana, knowledge, Atma Gyan, Tattva Gyan, so many important Tattva Gyan. Jnana vairagya, and because of the strength of the knowledge, and remember when we're saying here the Gyan, we're talking jnana vigyan, as confirmed in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Jnana vigyan. It's the person who has jnana vigyan who sees with equal vision the stone and the piece of gold and the clod of dirt. The jnana vigyan is in that Sanskrit. It says, touch tradathanai muneo, the person who has firm faith, the muni. Muni means he's a very good thinker. Uh, Touch Tradatana Muneo, Jnana Vairagya Yuktaya. He's linked up. Yukta. He's linked up with Jnana Vairagya. This is the spiritual master. Not that such a quote unquote spiritual master would be so foolish as to accept the slogan, the Bengali slogan, Mat Guru Si Jagaku, would be so foolish as to accept the slogan, just put on the uniform. So we were talking about the first uh, transformation um, and some of the rationales that were used to, that were imported to uh, support that transformation. As I said, there's three major deviations. And transformation, we're talking about change. We're not talking about making something a little better but not changing we're talking about big change and change means the authority is lost it's a different line when it's changed it's a different line it's not the same line and similarly we're seeing that now so many uh, very difficult to comprehend ideas that would have never had any credence whatsoever while Prophet was here. So many different ways and processes, so many different uh, conceptions about who is what and what is who. These would have never been tolerated while His Divine Grace was here, any of them. But this is the downline. When the movement gets dumbed down, you get just one deviation after another. You make one mistake. In order to cover it, you make two more. In order to cover those two, you make four more. And it just goes on and on and on, devolution. The first transformation took place. The seeds of the first transformation were already starting to become actuated while Prabhupada was still here. But it, it became a complete colossal hoax in March of 2000. Uh, excuse me, March of 1978. 
That was the first transformation. That was the first big deviation, namely the fabricated so-called ISKCON. Then the next major deviation was that this deviation had inequities in it. It had wrong uh, teachings. It had exploitation. Eligibility, Adhikar. These men were not eligible to be worshipped as Mahabhagavats. They weren't even eligible to be respected as gurus on the most fundamental of planes. But they were taking opulent worship as if they were Mahabhagavats in Nikunja Yuna Ratkeli Siddhai. So, as if they had actuated their Siddhadeya. So, this is naturally going to produce all kinds of uh, negative repercussions. Envy will be one of them. Faithlessness will be another. Challenge will be another. But since a quote-unquote higher authority was consulted in order to provide a good amount of the soil necessary for these 11 weeds to sprout, then the authority was again consulted that they're not doing it right. And so now we had, in 1980, the beginning of what I call the neo Mutt, which is the second deviation. neo Mutt, I use the term Neo because it's not the Mutt in the true sense of the term, but it's very much like the Mutt. If one says, well, Prabhupada was a member of the Mutt for a while he was, but if one says that Prabhupada's preaching mission was non-different from the Mutt, we must protest and say no. Even in the 1950s, when he formed his, uh, his ashram in Shansi, India, he called it League of Devotees. He didn't call it Gaudiamat, and it wasn't recognized by the Gaudiamat even then. And when he came to America, he didn't call his society Gaudiamat. And we could quote letter after letter after letter, and some room conversations also, in relation to Prabhupada's view of the Gaudiamat, which was not very laudatory. Now, the neo Mutt means that Prabhupada's disciples who are initiated by him go and adopt Gaudiamat philosophy, Gaudiamat uh, process, and it, most importantly, worst, Gaudiamat vision of Prabhupada, Gaudiamat vision of how to spread the movement. All of these Gaudiamat ways which Prabhupada was uh, not in harmony with, which Prabhupada as the Sampradaya Acharya, as the Shaktivesh avatar, who was empowered with the Bhakti Shakti, did not uh, say was had any value. In fact, in the letter of uh, 1974, April, to one of his uh, governing body commissioners, he said very clearly that they're, they're very competent to harm our natural progress in Krishna consciousness. And in 1970, he referred to them obliquely as the Great Sinister Movement. So we could just go on and on with that. The fact of the matter is that Prabhupada did not represent the Gaudiamat. He wanted very little to do with it. He had very little uh, interaction with it. Srila Prabhupada was directly Sakshadhari. When he spoke, it was Paramatma, it was Krishna speaking. Whatever he said was to be done is what Krishna wanted. And he said differently from Gaudiya Mutt ways. So when Prabhupada's initiated disciples who had some influence and some power in the movement then went back to the higher authority to complain about the 11 so-called Mahabhagavats who were actually all pretenders and sahajyas, full-blown sahajyas, then when they went back, then they had become converted to the Gaudiamat way, which was an entirely different way of, of viewing his divine grace through the Prabhupada, viewing how to spread Krishna consciousness, the process, and the Siddhanta also had differences. So that's why I use this term neo Gaudiamat, because it's new. It, it constitutes disciples who were initiated by Prabhupada who for all practical purposes gave up their connection with Srila Prabhupada to adopt connection with Gaudiamat ways. And in some cases even took quote-unquote reinitiation from a Gaudiamat Acharya or took sannyas from a Gaudiamat Acharya or things of this nature. This was the second transformation 
but it wasn't a transformation of the fabricated so-called ISKCON, which has already undergone the first transformation. There, there was a schism. Uh, ISKCON, quote-unquote ISKCON, uh, schismed with the neo Gaudi Mutt in 1982. So, the, uh, wouldn't you agree that the, um, that the uh, zonal Acharya deviation was resolved uh, in the, when they kind of reformed it, there was a reformation in the, in the mid-80s, I think? It was a dishonest resolution on a pragmatic, materially pragmatic, utilitarian plane that has nothing to do with spiritual truth, it was technically resolved in that they eliminated the zones and dropped the pretension, the profile of being Mahabhagavat. But the deviations were so egregious. The anarthas, the institutional anarthas and the personal anarthas were so severe that it, the, the real necessity was not met. The real necessity was to return to square one. Where did all these deviations start off from? What is the honest position now? Let us get back to the honest position. There'll be a lot of pain involved in that, but it's going to be more painful if we keep going on with the dishonesty. This was None of this was confronted on a deep level. Second echelon and third echelon men saw an opportunity to themselves become gurus at this more benign level with a little bit less pretension to it. So they jumped at the opportunity and made a compromise that, yes, we'll still recognize that this whole time you've been guru. This is not right. Of course, there was one minor expansion previous to this, where the 11 expanded to 14. But that didn't resolve anything. That was due to political pressure. So the mid-80s confrontational with the zonal acharyas simply dumbed down the deviation and disguised it a little better. Do you think there's any validity to the Ritvik position? The Ritvik position took place on a very, very subtle plane in the summer of 1988, where the seed for the Ritvik position was planted in the will of one of Prabhupada's godbrothers who happened to be that so-called higher authority. It sprouted in 1990 when four initiated disciples of Srila Prabhupada, all Brahminically initiated, got together in a southern state and determined that the way that Prabhupada actually wanted was that the governing body commissioner and commission was to appoint Ritvik Acharyas to recognize and appoint Ritvik Acharyas after his divine grace left man physical manifest existence. And that these appointed Ritvik Acharyas then, only given authority if the GBC recognized them as such, would then conduct initiations on behalf of Srila Prabhupada that all new people would actually be initiated by his divine grace Srila Prabhupada. This is an anti-Vedic, anti-Vaishnava process. This is a concocted process based on the Sahajism known as Kartapaja, one of the 13 Sahaja sects. But of course it's Neo-Kartapaja because it's in a context of the postmodern situation. Whereas the classical Sahajas were the time of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, those 13 Sahajas of which Kartapaja was one of them. It was specifically listed there as a Sahaja uh, sect by Bhaktivinoda Thakur, and it is as such, anti-Vedic, anti-Vaishnava. The process is you develop, a person who's uninitiated develops enough genuine spiritual sincerity, enough genuine seriousness in spiritual life, develops some important 
prerequisite preliminary knowledge and has to be lucky enough to be able to search out a guru and when coming in contact with a spiritual master or guru to recognize the guru and then to do enough service in a submissive attitude as we said before with good inquiries and with the seva attitude to be able to get the benediction that the guru will give diksha this is the vedic process we are in a judeo-christian civilization in the west in both europe australia and also in america canada all of these countries are predominantly judeo-christian although that percentage and ratio is decreasing it's still predominant but at that time when ritvik surfaced in 1990 the christian way was very prominent in the West. So this is a type of so-called Christianity where Jesus Christ is apparently the real spiritual master of the Christians and that these priests uh, simply are conduits but you don't receive anything from them except some good advice etc. You don't surrender to them. But that's not the Vedic process. That's not the Vaishnav process. So it's it's it fits very well in with the Western culture which is uh, reach such levels of deviation that they have uh, slaughterhouses and and that alcohol and various intoxications are legal and can be purchased and imbibed legally and all these other uh, incredible sinful activities are legal. This Ritvik process has to be completely dismissed because Srila Prabhupada never substantiated it. It's through a manipulation of a few code words that a whole new process has come into being that is completely anti-Vedic, anti-Vaishnava, and does not follow the tradition of the Guru Parampara. It is because the people who are buying into Ritvik and also the devotees who promulgated and started Ritvik and got it rolling, uh, it is due to their insincerity in spiritual life that this has grown. And the nature of Ritvik is that since it is a concoction, since it was never established by his divine grace through the Prabhupada, never specified how to do it because he never would specify it because it's bogus, that it's, uh, it's prone to be highly centrifugal, meaning that it'll keep spinning out of control into various new deviations, new uh, permutations of the Ritvik misconception. And that's exactly what we have. The original Ritvik conception has been completely abandoned. Nobody, nobody believes in it anymore. It never got off the ground. It was the start of it, but it never actually could take off and become something. Why? Because very simply, the Governing Body Commission never accepted it. And the Govern Bo Governing Body Commission had to accept it for it to function. Because the key element was that Ritviks could not just become Ritviks because they say they're Ritviks, and conduct initiations so-called on behalf of a, a spiritual master who is no longer physically manifest. But the original uh, theory that was promulgated was that Prabhupada established this so-called Ritvik, but he established it on the basis that the governing body commission had to decide who was qualified to be a Ritvik Acharya. But they didn't accept it, so therefore it never even went uh, to any level. But since that time, there's been various permutations and combinations of Ritvik. And right now, there's a minimum of five different Ritvik philosophies, Ritvik groups, and they are not very friendly with one another because they have a different process. Each of them has a different process. Even their conception of how long it is supposed to last is entirely different amongst some of the groups. And that's the nature of Ritvik. A concoction will breed more concoctions. It'll get more and more dumbed down. It'll get more and more deviant because there's no basis to go back to to establish what is the siddhanta of it and what is, and more importantly, what is the actual process? How is it to be carried out? It is not historical fact. Ritvik is not historical fact. It was never established by his divine grace through the prophet. Ritvik vad is the same as Maya vad in the sense it's a concoction based upon a wrong understanding pramad not listening properly, not hearing properly, therefore being illusioned, therefore making the mistake of buying into it, and therefore kaitava, cheating, spreading a process that's a cheating process. You don't think there's any value? Somebody... Well, as I described before, somebody who's picking uh, uh, molded bread out of a garbage can 
can go to any place like any temple and learn the ABCDs and become a little clean and get free from some of his extremely degraded activities. So there's some ABCD benefit. But once we get to GHI, Guru, Honesty and Institution, or Guru, Honesty and Initiation, then it's going to go off. It's going to be a deviated octum. It's, it'll be an ascending octave for some time, but then it'll reach a stage where faithlessness will enter. And when faithlessness enters, it'll become a descending octave. And the person will think it's still an ascending octave when it's a descending octave. The principle is that you stay on a complete straight course towards the spiritual sky. If you stay loyal to your spiritual master, loyal to the process, loyal to the seva, loyal to the siddhanta. But if you go on a deviated ascending octave, you're going towards a different destination that's not actually what he wants. It's not what the Guru Parampara wants. It's not what this what the Supreme Personality of Godhead is actually sanctioned. And therefore it goes up for a ways, then it reaches a point where faithlessness enters, and it becomes a descending octave at the same deviated incline. And you don't recognize any of it because you didn't stay on the actual octave. You deviated off to another destination, and you thought, ah, this destination is the real destination, but it's not. All these rhythmic groups can help you if you're very fallen, they can help you with ABCD, but you need to go far beyond ABCD. You need to go through the whole alphabet and become a pure devotee of the Lord. And in order to do that, Ritvik can't help you. You said earlier it was all due to lack of sincerity, the, the, the um, development of the Ritvik process. Could you expand on that? Sincerity is a word that comes from Latin. In the Latin times, they had coins, but they also uh, did a lot more barter than we do today. Barter is not so popular due to so much money that we have in the West. Some barter goes on, but most people don't live by barter. But at that time, in the Roman times, uh, goods were bartered. If you wanted a, a, a winter's worth of wheat in order to eat, perhaps you had a very nice statue and you could barter your statue for the bushels of grains, and the person who wanted that nice statue would make the deal. So these statues were a commodity that were traded at that time. Now, if a statue gets a chip in it, right now we see that the statues from the Roman times, virtually all of them have chips. But when they were first made, uh, a statue was considered extremely valuable during the Roman times if it had no chips but if it had chips in it, then its value was greatly diminished to the point that you could hardly even barter it for anything. So because to keep a statue free from chips was the goal in order to have this valuable commodity, if it developed a chip, a cheating process of putting a type of covering into the chip that looked like it was part of the stone sculpture when actually it was, a, it was filling the chip, this is called ceres. What was put in was, was called ceres, C-E-R-E-S. You put it in and then you polished it up and you tried to uh, pawn off that uh, statue as if it had never had any chips. So sin, S-I-N, as a prefix in Latin meant without. It still means without. So the word sincere is sinceres. It comes from that, meaning without any ceres in the statues that when you're bartering with a real thing, there's no chips in it that have been covered by ceres, that then you barter it off, get all this wealth from it, and then the person who has the statue, then he wants to move it, and then somebody else comes and said, that's a chip. That, and then, I've been cheated. But what, so sin, if you were sincere then, you didn't, whatever you were giving was not with a flaw in it. So, if you're sincere in seeking out a spiritual master, that means you don't have the flaws within you of ulterior motivation, personal ambition, all kinds of uh, contaminated misconceptions about what is the path of spiritual life. You're free from all these chips in you, and you're not covered with a rationalization and with buffers and with delusions, uh, ceres. You're not, you don't have your sin ceres, you're without those things. So, supposing today you met someone who <clears throat> came across some of Srila uh, Prabhupada's original Bhagavad Gita, read it, 
was interested, wanted to, wanted to go forward uh, with Krishna consciousness. But he was on his own, wasn't really in touch with any other groups. And you met this person, uh, and he asked for your advice. What to do in such a chaotic uh, world, Krishna conscious world that we're in now. What advice would you give that person? I'd give him truth. I'd give him a historical fact. I'd answer his questions. And I'd also tell him that we have an organization. So there's a place where he can plug in, if he likes, and he can get his answers, and he can get save opportunities, and he can stay free from these three deviations. So how was your organization uh, better than the other other organizations that we see around us? Because there's no Upasitanta connected to what we're preaching. The process we give is without any contaminations, even though it's rudimentary. We do not have in our organization anyone who's connected with the deviations, nor will we ever have anyone. Nor do we compromise with the deviations, nor do we say that they're good. We do not uh, put any stock into watering it down. We say, advance in Krishna consciousness at your own pace, at your own speed. Cleansing of the heart is not an abrupt process, it's a gradual process. At the same time, you can't go to the other shore if you leave the anchor dropped and it's caught in rocks. We say at the very minimum, you have to have your anchor free from being dropped into those rocks and you must be at the very minimum pulling it up to get it back in the boat so you can really go somewhere. Supposing in a parallel parallel universe you were invited to next year's um, GBC meeting in Mayapur and, and you were asked to give your recommendations to help ISKCON. What can you imagine that you might say to them? I would say to them, you all have to return to square one. None of you is a genuine guru. You never were. A current still runs through it, and that current is the current of deviation, the current of misconception, the current of pretension, the current of deception. These things, these things cannot be present in a genuine Krishna consciousness movement. And you have had these things in your movement from the spring of 1978, Although they were creeping in before that time, we can just say that was the coup d'etat uh, moment. And now you've got to return and get all of that out. And it can be done if you understand that Prabhupada said, regular guru, that's all. Regular guru means under regulation. And he didn't name any gurus. He said, but by my order, but he never gave the order. Which means that we have to go back to square one and say that those 11 pretender Maha Bhagavats were all completely bogus and that was such a colossal hoax and such a colossal deviation that everything went off track and that current is still present in the movement. It has not been taken away. The current of deviation has been present throughout the movement since 1978. And you can make all the bureaucratic adjustments and compromises you want but this stark truth is going to remain. These historical facts are going to remain. And there's going to be devotees who've been initiated by His Divine Grace who are continue to understand them and are going to continue to let others know about them. And you're not going to get away with it. You're not going to pull it off. So therefore, you better return to square one. That would be my advice. That's a pretty big pill for them to swallow. Um... Do you have any practical suggestions? How yeah, the practical suggestion is they aren't going to invite me. <laughs> no, practical suggestions how the square one is, how, how to get back to that square one. Yes. Shock. It's not until devotees individually get shocked and realize just how corrupt the whole thing has been and how it's getting more and more corrupt, how it's becoming more and more dumbed down and watered down, it's becoming more and more deviant and realize that it'll get worse and worse and worse and realize that they want no part of it they want to get back to the real Krishna conscious movement and then one by one as devotees realize this then they'll get strong individually 
then they'll start thinking, maybe I should have some kind of relationship with other devotees who are a little stronger than me and are on this path. And then there'll be a little bit of a coalescing, perhaps some alliances. Then there'll be an actual uh, organization. And then things will go on and on like that. And so it's a very, it'll be a very gradual process. Okay. Can you tell us a bit how you came to Christian consciousness? Yes, I came because... I reached the stage where actually I saw the futility of even breathing. I reached the stage where I could see that on your own, whatever you're doing does not solve anything. Once you realize the question that must take place, the Tato Brahma Jigyasa, this question is, why am I suffering? And most importantly, why do I have to die? Why do I have to undergo all of this? I am being forced to undergo all of this. Why? This question I asked. I reached the stage where I asked this question. When you ask these root questions, you get signals from Paramatma, but you don't know it. But you get signals from conscience, and when I'm speaking of conscience here, I'm using a capital C, because small conscience is different from capital C conscience. Paramount will give you tests. My first uh, dictation was become vegetarian. And immediately I did. Now, I did not know where it would lead. I did not know who was giving the order, but I knew that that was what I had to do. It was made very clear that I had to pass that test. So I became a vegetarian. Then I was tested severely when I went home to visit my uh, relatives. And I was given a very uh, stern punishment for having not met the standard there. Because I got talked out of it partially. And therefore, in that punishment, that solidified that this is definitely what is wanted to be done. But I still did not know where it was all going to lead.